And now to meet our second contestant, will you uh, sign in after you have entered, please? Beauty night. Kelly. Lang, right, ma'am? Is it Miss or Mrs. Lang? Miss. Miss Lang. And where are you from? Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Nice to have you with us. Miss Lang, may I present the panel? Thank you. Yeah. Now, if you'll join me over here, we'll let the audience in the theater and the audience at home know exactly what your line is. Mm -hmm. All right. Panel, we can tell you that Miss Lang is salaried and deals in a service. And... We'll begin things with Martin Gay. Thank you, John. Miss Lang, you look so stylish. Have you anything to do with fashions? No. One down and nine to go, Miss Felder. Um, I'm responsible, right? Um, in performing this service, do you move in a um, physical way? Oh, yes. Some, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, some or yes, enthusiastically. There was <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> yes, unequivocally, yes. Uh, yes, you move. Uh, no. you, you move physically. Um, uh, then I can assume that the movement, your movement, uh, in relationship to the people that are observing this service or availing themselves of the service, is an important part of the service. Yes, you're right. Do, do you remove any part of your costume at any time you're performing this? Heaven forbid. Heaven forbid. Take a guess, Bennett. Do you do anything that improves the condition of a house that you go into? No. no. I thought she was a plumber. No, actually, it was water. No, Mar so Martin opened the door part way, but nobody took it up and opened it the rest of the way. When Martin asked if it was anything to do with television or the theater, and you forgot radio. Oh. Because actually what uh, Miss Lang does is to broadcast traffic reports from a helicopter over oh. KABC oh. in Los Angeles. <laughs> she is known to all those in Los Angeles who are, who are saying, well, gee, I never heard uh, Kelly Lang in the, in the helicopter as a result of a naming contest, correctly, uh, Kelly, who does it in the morning, is known as Dawn O'Day, and her colleague who works in the afternoon is known as Evo Day. So that's uh -huh. how you will recognize it better, the KABC listeners in Los Angeles. That was fun, Kelly. <coughs> Hope you enjoyed it, and thanks a lot for coming to see us. Nice Thank to you, see you. Mm -hmm. This is the KNBC News Service with Paul Moyer and Ross Porter and Kelly Lang. Now, Paul Moyer. Good evening, everybody. As we this is the KNBC News Service with Tom Brokaw and Ross Porter and Kelly Lang. Now, Tom Brokaw. Good evening. A lot of things aren't showing up tonight, including our theme music. This is the KNBC News Service with Paul Moyer, Ross Porter with the Bold Day's Eve Report, and Kelly Lang answers the new logical question, will it rain in our parade? Here Hi, everybody. I'm Ross Porter. Well, one of my favorite people is here with us today, and you're going to love hearing from her. I mean, the things she's done, unbelievable. Where do I start? A model, a helicopter traffic reporter a radio and television news reporter, a TV weather forecaster, talk show host, broadcast journalist, first woman anchor on any of NBC-owned TV stations, first female news anchor in Los Angeles, regular co-host of several NBC network programs, author of six mystery fiction books, and much more. Here is the multi-talented Kelly Lang. Well, hi, Ross. I'm exhausted just hearing you tell all the things I've done. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so many, so many things to talk about with you, and 
You've done so well. Uh, let's start at the very first. You were born in New York. How long did you live in the East? Well, um, we were New Yorkers and my dad died when I was just six months old. So my mother took my sister and I to Boston where I grew up. And um, I went to college back there in Andover, Massachusetts, Merrimack College. And after college, I came out here. Now, when you graduated with honors at Merrimack College in Massachusetts, you majored in Shakespeare. Now, I'm going to think <laughs> that that gave you a chance to appear in some plays. Did that help your self-confidence in, in speaking on your feet? Gosh, I don't know. You know, I never really thought about it much. Um, and another thing I never thought about was the gender thing. You know, the first woman this, the first woman that, the first woman news writer at KBC Radio. The first, and uh, Betty White, the other day when all the news was about Betty, and she, she got that question and, and she said, I never thought about women and gender and being the first anything. And, and I said, that's me. I never thought about it either. And it never occurred to me that a woman can't do anything we want. So I just did it, you know? Well, what did, what did you plan to do with a degree after majoring in Shakespeare? Well, it was really English literature and Shakespeare. Um, I intended to teach school. That's what my mother wanted me to do. You know, Boston and Irish and Catholic and teach school and have something to fall back on. And I did get my teacher's credentials from, uh, from the state of Massachusetts which of course doesn't work in California, but yeah. <laughs> well, you were later honored uh, by your alma mater with the Alumni Achievement Award at Mary Mac. Yes. Uh, wh why did you move to Southern California in the mid uh, 1960s? Well, um, I, you know, my wonderful cousin whom I adore and I found out this morning, Ross, that she passed away, it breaks my heart. Oh, but I'm sorry. Oh, story. She was a stewardess for American Airlines and she was so beautiful. She looked like a young Elizabeth Taylor. And, and uh, she was my role model. So I uh, applied and became a stewardess for United Airlines. Hmm. And the, um, the stewardess training school was in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So they put me on an airplane. First time I'd ever been on an airplane in my life. I mean, we're talking the year one, right, Ross? Um, <laughs> and so I went to Cheyenne and um, there were... Uh, of all the people in my stewardess class, there were about 20 of us, they passed out the domicile, you know, where you would be based according to your age you got to pick. And I happened to be the youngest person in that class. So of course I wanted Boston, I wanted New York, I wanted the East, that's where I was from. And I got the last choice, which was Salt Lake City, Utah. Salt Lake <laughs> City, I didn't even know where it was, you know? Um, but there I went and I, I really was a good skier in Salt Lake, you know, that's where oh, the great Wasatch Mountain Range is. And, um, and from there I went, I transferred a base to Seattle and then transferred another six or eight months later to San Francisco. So I got, and then, oh yeah, oh gosh, you're bringing all this up, Ross. Um, my boyfriend was Jim Lang at the time in San Francisco. I don't know if you remember him, he hosted the dating game well, let me, let me just get to that quickly. And I wanted to ask you this. I've never asked you this question. We've known oh, each I know. other. I never We've answered that other. question. We've known each other for 50 years. I've never asked you. No. But I was told that one day, oh, boy. Lang called you at home. You were not there. Your voicemail came on. And he said, Kelly, Lang, call me. And you liked it so much. You changed your name, true or false? You changed my name. My name was Kelly Snyder. That's not why, by the way. But anyway, uh, then Jim had to come down, move to L.A. because he got the dating game. And then he worked for KMPC Radio, too, during a morning show. Oh, yeah. And that's how I landed in L.A. So I just happened to get the job in Los Angeles. It could have been, you know, Long Bony Fingers, Nebraska. It could have been anywhere. But being that my first broadcast job was in Los Angeles, that became part of my lucky stars, you know? Because LA is where everybody comes through, whether they're an author, a politician, a sports uh, hero, everybody comes through LA to do their PR. So we got to, I got to interview everybody here and went from one show to the other. 
Well, as you say, you wanted to be certified as a school teacher. Hey, and, yeah. and I know some years later, and you'll have to tell me how many, you taught at Beverly Hills High School. What subject and how long? All right, here's what happened there, Ross. Um, my daughter was going to Hollywood High and I was seeing terrible news stories about guns in the, in the hallways and what have you. And I decided to pull her out of Hollywood High and send her to a private school. By that time I could afford it. And then I took her to different schools around the area and we sat in on classes. And um, I remember one school, and I won't mention the name of it, very important, big deal, expensive private school. And we sat in on the class and the teacher said to the kids, well, uh, you know, uh, we're talking about you, the maids that your, your parents work in your house, you know, uh, the cleaning people and they're black. And I grabbed my daughter, I said, we're out of here. This is not where you're going to school, you know? And, um, and anyway, I wanted to get her into Beverly High because I did some research on it and it was, they ran for classes just like you do in college. It was very, very cool education. I went over there and I was told, um, no, you to get into Beverly High, to get a child into Beverly High, you have to either live in Beverly Hills, which I did not, or work at Beverly High School, which I did not. So I said, okay, I'll work here. You know, I'll teach here. I'll teach journalism. And she said, you know, everybody wants to get their kids into Beverly High. Zsa Zsa Gabor wanted her children, her child to come here and we couldn't, we couldn't take her. She lives up in, uh, I don't know where, some Bel Air or something. And I said, well, Zsa Zsa can't teach journalism. I can. And so, they took me on, they hired me. I didn't take any money. I refused to take any money. And um, I taught for as long as Kelly was there. And it was her third year and her second, third and fourth year of high school. Right. And it was so easy for me because I would bring over all you guys. You were already gone, but um, you had to bring Brokaw, Jess Marlowe, Brian Gumbel, all the sports guys and, and, Abernathy, remember Bob Abernathy? And, yeah. they would, and they would sit in on a class with me and the kids would be able to talk to them. Oh, so it, it wasn't really a terribly tedious job for me, but it was terrific. It got my child graduated from Beverly High and everybody was happy. Well, just a satellite to that, for those of you uh, who didn't know, uh, there were 19 oil wells located adjacent to Beverly Hills High School. Yes. They were all plugged two years ago. Did the smell ever interrupt you during your teaching over there? Oh, no, no. And actually, I did teach um, some journalism. I'm not just saying I brought the celebrities over with me, and, uh, but I did. Um, I, I worked out a whole curriculum for myself, and I especially taught them how to get a job. You know, um, I, I talked about that a lot. And there were a lot of kids interested in doing it. I hope some of them made it. You were a model in 1967. Yes. And you went to a shopping mall in Buena Park, California. That day changed your life. Tell yeah. everyone why. Oh, yeah. Now, I was a model. I hated modeling, by the way. But it was a way for me to make you know, a good deal of money. I had a child to bring up. And um, well. I had just really recently moved, uh, not, not too long, well, I guess maybe a year or so, to LA with Jim. And um, I saw the LA Times had an, an, an ad saying, KABC Radio is searching for a ladybird. What was a ladybird? It was a woman who was going to fly in a helicopter and do traffic on the freeways. So I said, why not? So I went down there. And this first one, Ross, was in uh, Studio City at, on Riverside Drive. Right. And I went over there, showed up, and there was a big, long line of women waiting to get into this trailer that they had turned into a studio. And I stood in line, and um, they gave me a form to fill out. And I wrote my real name, you know, Kelly Snyder. This is how I got the Kelly Lang thing, Kelly Snyder. and. Um, I got into the trailer when, an hour later when it was my turn. They sat me down and 
it was a woman dressed in a spacesuit that was running this contest. She pinned a number on my shirt, put a headset on my ears and said, all right, now when you hear the engineer say, begin, then state your name and read this. And uh, she gave me a copy, a piece of paper and I looked at it. And when he said, begin, I said, I'm Kelly Snyder. And I read the copy, which was traffic on the Hollywood freeway is backed up through um, Coinga Pass and traffic on the 101 and traffic on the 405 is very boring, very dry. So when I got finished with it, I said, oh, so uh, so can I do it again? Because now I can give it a little more life now that I know. And the woman said, no, nobody, everybody gets one shot. So, uh, and she threw me out of the back door of the trailer and she said, next. And another woman came in and she looked at me because I'm still looking up what just happened, you know? And she said, and you, and pointed to me. She said, don't you try coming to it. Don't you come to another one of our locations because that is also against the rules. So, of course, she gave me the idea, right? So I waited. And that's when I noticed that the ad was in the paper, LA Times, every day. And it was at a different location everywhere between um, Santa Barbara and the Mexican border, which was <laughs> radio station's coverage area you know, for KABC. So I waited a decent period, a couple of weeks, and I picked Buena Park. California, you're right. Different direction. Um, I Instead of wearing a skirt, I wore pants and I had long hair. I put it up under my hat, under a hat, changed my look, changed my name. And I used Jim's name because I used his address and he, we didn't live together, obviously. Um, I, why is that obvious? I don't know, because you know, I was a good Catholic girl. Anyway, um, they... Uh, I put his address and his phone number so that if I got a call, he would get it because I, I would be cheating, you know? Um, I didn't want them to remember that I was the same. I came, and so then when I, I and then on my, on the drive to Buena Park, oh, and the night before I wrote my own copy. I am a writer, you know that. Yes, so I do. I wrote uh, very funny stuff. In my copy, I had a guy who was on the 405 traffic was so terrible he was in a camper he went up top uh and sat on the camper with his legs crossed and a cup of coffee and was reading the paper stuff like that ridiculous <laughs> stuff and then on my drive from my house to buena park which was about an hour i memorized my copy so that when i got in line um the same line same long line of women uh, it was the same woman and my heart's going boom, boom you know, because I, I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to get caught. You know, I had Catholic guilt. Right. And um, but she didn't notice, obviously, because they were everywhere. All of it was hundreds of thousands of women who entered this contest. So um, she she uh, she said the same thing. She said in the headset said, when begin, state your name and read this. And she gave me the copy and I looked at it, it was the same thing that I had read uh, in Studio City. So I said, um, you know, what if I used my own words? I might be more comfortable. Is that okay with you? And she says, I don't care. She didn't care. You know, she'd been all over the place. She said, sure, whatever you want to do. So I then, uh, when he said begin, I said, I said, uh, good morning. I'm Kelly Lang and um, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and I started saying my thing. And I was so good, really, because I had it down. And that she she said after she said, oh, my, she said, um, so where are you going to be in case we want to call you? And I said, I will be sitting on the curb in front of your radio station or something like that. I mean, I was funny. So um, I did get the call. And they told me that I was one of the top 79 because oh. there was 79 on the dial, oh. you know, on the 79. Uh, in their search for a ladybird, would I come in and have another interview? So I went to work and I wrote another thing of different copy. I went in and then uh, I, oh, and Jim told me, he said, you know, cause he was working for KMPC. And he said, look, I know radio. All right. He said, they already have somebody to do that job. They're not going to be giving a job. This is just a great big uh, PR situation that they're all over and everybody's interested in it. And he said, so don't bother, you're wasting your time going back, coming back and forth. But of course, did I listen to him? No. Uh, so then I was one of the top 40, then I was one of the top 25. And they finally, when they got down to the top six, 
they brought six of us into, uh, into LAX where they had a helicopter set up on a private lot and they were to put us in the, in the helicopter one at a time and go up and look down and tell what we were seeing. So the six of us are sitting there, we're a nervous wreck. The first girl, they put her in the helicopter. She went up and we could hear her, you know? So she was talking about there's trees and there's houses. And, and then she said, oh, she said, I'm so scared. I just wet my pants, I have to come down. And, and I, I mean, I'll never forget that. They took her down and I announced <laughs> to the crowd, I said, we were six. And now we are five. <laughs> you know? yeah. But anyway, I did get the job um, doing morning radio. And it was, and I, of course, I told you I had my daughter and um, she was, a, she was a baby. And a lot of times um, I couldn't afford to have a babysitter come in, you know, uh, at that hour of the morning. And so a lot of times I would just throw her in, in the backseat of the helicopter and bring a ducky and a book or something. And and uh, she'd be fine. And then we'd land the, the helicopter at some point during commercial, during a break. Cause I did a, a, I did a spot every nine minutes in the helicopter yeah. and, uh, and she was fine. She grew up to be normal and a big Dodger fan. What can I say? <laughs> they, you know gave you, they gave you the 6 a.m. to oh, 9 a.m. segment and you were called Dawn O'Day. Now, did you have to wear those tight fitting silver jumpsuits even oh, in the yeah. helicopter yes yeah. silver lame stretch jumpsuit with a big logo right here that said kabc dawn o'day they had a contest i mean i was just trying to get used to my new phony name kelly lang and now they were <laughs> and the person who won the contest uh got to name me the naming contest so i was dawn o'day which you know i hated but hey um and i was going to tell you ross I remember my salary. You always remember your first money. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, they paid me $10,000 a year. But that was, you know, back in the Stone Age, right? Yeah. And for $10,000 a year, I was able to own a house, uh, to drive a Jaguar XKE, uh, to pay for a nanny for my child. I mean, that's, that's the difference between then and now, you know? Yeah. Everything was, you know, a nickel for this and and 15 cents for lunch. And, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say my age and don't you dare ask me, but it's all over the internet anyway. And I'm contemporary of yours and Brokaw's and Tom Snyder's and everybody's, you know, so, so, you know, you know how long ago that was, what a different time it was, huh? Yeah. Did you ever do the evening shift of traffic or morning only? Well, they fired me at one point. Um, <laughs> a couple of uh, years in uh, because they wanted to save money. They fired both of us and they put the pilot, they had the pilot doing it. And then, uh, but Jack Myers, who was my boss, program director over KBC, uh, he really liked me and he called me in and he said, look, I don't wanna lose you. I want you to be a writer, a news writer. And I said, I don't know how to do that. And he said, that's right, we'll teach you. And that's how I became a news writer. I was the first news writer in the newsroom that was a woman. And I remember he brought me in the first day and introduced me and there were, there were 11 guys. And one of them said, I mean, they were kind of bored. Yeah, okay, hello. And busy, you know, in the morning, busy for the morning uh, news block. And um, so one of them said, oh good, now we have somebody to make the coffee. And I never <laughs> got that, you know? And I said, oh guys, I'm sorry, I don't drink coffee. So I don't even know how to make it. I won't be making the coffee. And that kind of, told them that, you know, I'm not going to scrub their floors or windows either. And, uh, but I learned how to write because they gave me the bad shift there too. The overnight, the, the cub got the overnight. That was from midnight to eight in the morning, but that's a whole nother story. Um, and then the pilot wasn't doing very well. And one of my jobs as a news writer was to feed him uh, traffic information, mm -hmm. but he just didn't have it. He had it to fly, but not to broadcast. So they asked me to come back on the air and uh, do the morning and the evening. And then in between, I was doing the modeling. I mean, I've always worked hard. Haven't we always yeah. worked well, hard? You've been first? one of the hardest workers I've ever seen. Um, you had to. That's been, that's been one of your strengths forever. Uh, you know, during that period, Kelly, when you think about it, and I was looking back at it, there were three 
helicopter traffic reporters in Los Angeles yep. who were killed in crashes while on duty. Did oh, you yeah. have any close calls? Yes, I had three of them. I won't, uh, you know, uh, go chapter and verse, but on the last one, um, we were almost hit head on. We had a gentleman's agreement uh, between all of us up there uh, that we would fly the right side of the freeways coming and going so that, and then this time there was a fixed wing guy and we were in a fixed wing then because that chopper was down for service. And um, there was a guy who owned an airplane, had a pilot's license and was taking his secretary to Vegas for, for uh, Thanksgiving. And he hadn't, he hadn't filed a flight report or, and didn't have any lights on, any running lights on. And mm. my pilot was on the right side where we were supposed to be. And he was coming the other way on the same side. And we damn near hit the other plane. My pilot made a maneuver and he flipped over and brought us in, skidding in to Van Nuys Airport. Oh. That was at the end of my broadcasting. It was my third near miss. And I was trembling and I got out of, and my pilot was crying. It was that close. He was a big strapping guy and oh. he was crying. And I got an, in, out of the plane and went into the airport and called my boss at home. And I said, and I was sob, kind of, you know, sniffling. And I said, Jack, I got to resign. He said, what are you talking about? What, what resign, when? And I said, looked at my watch. I said, as of six minutes ago, I can't do this anymore. And I explained what happened. And so he said, well, he said, um, come, come in in the morning uh, to the station and we'll talk about this. But I knew I couldn't do it anymore. And in fact, when I finally went to television, one of my uh, prerogatives, one of my deals was I will never fly in the helicopter. I couldn't do any stories from, and they wanted me to, you know, because I knew how to do that, but I couldn't. And let me just interrupt. One of the three men killed. Oh yeah. Francis Gary Powers, who oh. was at Channel 4. Oh. The man oh. who of course was involved with the U-2 and the spy mission over Russia. Did you work with him at the same time? Oh, yes. Oh, Ross, you're bringing tears to my eyes again. Um, and Jess Marlowe was very, very close to, to Frank. And he reported the story and cried. What happened was he wanted, um, Francis wanted so badly to be a reporter. Uh, and we bought that very heavy helicopter from Channel 5. They created that great big helicopter with all the cameras, all the equipment. And he had never flown a helicopter, but they had him take lessons and learn how to fly a helicopter. Not that hard, I learned too. Um, so he was covering a fire in Santa Barbara and he had to get it back. That was when we were putting the film in, you know, in solution, it, there were no cell phone, there were no uh, mini cams or anything. No. So we had to get the tape back to the station to be developed to get on the early news. And he had X amount of gas and he thought he could make it. He didn't take into consideration how heavy this helicopter that we owned was. Mm. And he ran out of gas, Ross. It was just so awful. He was such a lovely, lovely man. And that also- was, That was about yeah. four, I think you were there with four years doing the helicopter yeah. uh, assignment. And then um, you were hired by, by KNBC, Channel 4 in Los Angeles. Yes. Did, you, did you approach them or did an agent do that for you? Well, that, that's another long, interest, interesting those, I think, story. <laughs> I, um, I didn't have an agent who had agents then. I certainly didn't. But anyway, um, somebody from, the, from Channel 4 called me because they had remembered that I had come in. Um, I, I was looking to get into television and um, I went to every single station. There were seven of them then, Ross, uh, ABC, CBS, NBC, and the four independents. Right. And I went to every one of them uh, one by one, made appointments and to, to ask them if I could have a job, you know? And uh, it was no, 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 I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of them heard me on the radio in the morning because I was on when they were driving to work. And I remember the guy from CBS 2, Channel 2, said to me, you know, you are terrific. I hear you every morning. You're fun. You're funny. You're good. He said, but I'm sorry. We have our girl. 
And that was Ruth Ashton Taylor. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, and, and I thought that's what's put me in my place. Wow. They, these stations want an anchor. There was only one at that time, an anchor and a commentator and a sports guy and um, weather person and a girl. That's where we fit in one. Right. Right. And, but um, NBC, the guy there remembered or the, a woman called me and she said, we remember you came in to talk to our program director. And I want to tell you that we have decided to put a woman on the weekend weather. Are you interested? And I said, oh, yes, of course I am. When do I start? She said, well, it's not exactly that way. We're going to ask you to come in and interview and audition for the job. So I said, okay. Um, and she said, you can have, uh, as of two weeks from now, we're interviewing on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So when would you like to come in? I said, the earliest you have. So I went in on a Wednesday and I got there and all these women were there. Ross, they were all gorgeous. They went to the model agencies, the theatrical agencies, beautiful, tall, leggy, gorgeous, lot of hair, women and me, okay? So, uh, and then I sat there the whole time while they took one after another after another. And the drill was this, they had set up three panels, glass panels uh, in, on a contraption. And they had a guy who would send out the first glass panel and the candidate behind the panel had to write backwards uh, so that it would come out frontwards on television. That was what they were doing. They were gonna do that. Mm. And uh, so they send out the first one and it was um, Miller bars and all this stuff I didn't understand anyway. And, uh, and then uh, the map of California would come out and I had to put numbers backwards on TV uh, on the, on the, with chalk on the glass. Mm. And everybody was doing that and all these gorgeous women were up there and they were writing backwards and frontwards and giggling and dropping the chalk and it was terrible, but they were all gorgeous. Um, and then they ran out of time and they said, okay, come back tomorrow, everybody, because it was gonna be Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. And I was scheduled for Friday. By that time, uh, oh, I, oh I forgot to tell you the main thing was that first day after, um, it's a long time ago, Ross, you know? I know. <laughs> first day, after um, everybody, they said, go home, everybody, come back tomorrow. I stayed until everybody left. And then I watched as the same guy who was sending out the glass panels pushed the set out of the elephant doors in the studio and down the hall. And I followed him. And he went on the big elevator with the set, brought it down to the basement. Did you ever go in the basement at NBC, Ross? They, no. Oh, I couldn't believe it. Here, I'm, I'm a kid, you know, I'm looking. Here's the set for Hollywood Squares over here, Days of Our Lives over here, you know? And he pushes the set somewhere to park it till tomorrow, the next day, because they got to use the studio upstairs. So, so I said to the guy, I said, you know, I'm going to be doing this. Uh, I'm going to be um, auditioning for this on Friday. Would you mind if I just picked up the chalk that was on the ledge and just tried writing backwards on it a little bit? And he said, eh, okay. So I did, I got behind it and then he got into it and he started pushing out the, the California map, pushing out the, the country map and telling me this and pushing it back. And, and I, start, I did it and, and I started drawing trees. I'm pretty artistic by the way, and clouds and rain and the big sun and all this. So he was great. He, he worked with me for an hour. I wow. went home, yeah. I don't know what else he had to do. He was getting paid for it, but he didn't do that. Anyway, I went home and um, for the next two days, I stood in front of my bathroom mirror with chalk and I practiced so that by the time Friday, I was good, Russ. And I had a whole, I had a whole thing worked out where I was talking about here and the different, you know, the deserts and the, and the beaches and blah, blah, blah. I had it down. I was good. I wrote backwards. I made trees and so, and I got the job, hands down. So I guess I saw, you know, in the newspaper, somebody had interviewed me about uh, what, what, what I was about. And the headline in the LA Times said, Kelly Lang tells how she lied and cheated to the top. Oh. Uh, you know, I, I thought, oh. I felt it was being creative, you know? So, and it was, and, you know, it was supposed to be a joke. But, um, but I think 
if we can pass that on to young people to think out of the box, you know? Yeah. And, but, and work. Oh my gosh, work, work, work. Didn't we do that, Ross Porter? Well, yeah, but I'm thinking to myself, everybody knows, and you know, you're not a meteorologist. Oh, no. So how did you prepare or sound like one? Uh, folks, the high is over Canada and the low is over Arizona and they will collide <laughs> day after tomorrow. I mean, how did you do that? Well, first of all, you know, I studied, I researched and I, every day I and all the rest of the weather people you saw then and you still see now called, made a call to the National U.S. Weather Service, right? And I got to, I made friends over there sure. and they were willing to give me all kinds of stuff and they did. So I was able to use that with the nuts and bolts. But there was another shtick that I dreamed up myself because I was doing the weather with Tom Snyder. And uh -huh. you know, Tom, Tom loved you and he loved me. He didn't like a lot of people and most people there did not like him, but he loved you and me and we loved him. And so I'm, I'm doing the weather and I would, sit, I would pick out a different part of the... Uh, coverage area every night like um oh in pear blossom they're having their pear festival on the weekend and uh and i remember to, and then tom would always bat it back and forth and he'd make his off you know his sort of blue jokes this sort of right under the, the what was mm -hmm. available yeah. mm -hmm. we did that then we could <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, i remember saying um i had a picture of the woman who was the melon queen of some place and i say and and i said tom and, um, and she said she would love to show you her melons. She was head of the, the melon um, festival. <laughs> and, and Tom would say, oh yeah, I want to see her melons, you know? <laughs> yeah. We did that every night. Yeah. And we had fun and it was funny every single night. And he'd say, and you would say it's be 68 degrees in pear blossom as you're yeah. walking by all of the exhibits. Right. For those of you who are going to the melon festival in pear blossom, it's going to be, you know, 82 degrees, very warm, you know, uh, peel off and wear your halter top or something. I remember one time I got in an elevator downtown going somewhere and the elevator door opened and out came a whoosh of pot. There were two guys in there, they were smoking marijuana, you know? Oh. And I got in the elevator and stood facing the door like you do. And one guy said to the other, oh my God, that's the lady who talks dirty on television. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. They had right. so many. Yeah. Yeah, How did you go about convincing the news director that you wanted to do news? That I wanted to anchor and do and and report. Just, just yeah. do news yeah. and get off the weather. Well, I'll tell you that too is another story. Um, they we were winning everything. You know, we hands down we were number one. And um, and uh, I remember. Do you remember Joe Bartlemy? He was head of the station. You bet. Sure, and you he bet. Came out and he said well, we have a new contract for you. And it was much better. It was terrific. And another four year deal. And I said, Joe, I want to anchor the news. I want to report. I want to get out on the street and do the news. And he said, well, we can't do that. You're part of our team. You're a big part of it. That mean that would mean we have to get somebody to replace you. And it would mean that putting you it, from the weather to uh, a news, nobody would believe you. You don't have the credibility. And I said, uh, yeah, I can do it. I said, and if I can't do it here. I'm going to go do it. He said, well, who's going to hire you? Nobody's going to hire you. But I took that chance too. And um, I didn't sign the contract. They kept bringing me more money. more. And then and then they sent me to New York. They said, we, we, uh, who was it? Um, gosh, Mulholland. Bob was Mulholland. Sid, all right. All right. Was okay. Sid Graw part of that? Sid Graw? Sid Graw, sure. Yeah. Sid Graw is the one who grabbed Tom Snyder out of wherever he was in Brian. Philadelphia. No, it was, yeah, Philadelphia. So um, so they they put me on an airplane. First time I'd ever ridden first class, you know, and sent me to New York to get me to sign that contract. Um, and I bought a new suit, looking good, you know. And, uh, and when I got there and Bob Mulholland uh, met with me and he, he said, you know, nobody's going to hire you doing the news. None of the stations. I know them all. I know the network stations, I know all the general managers. And, um, but look what we're giving you. And, and it was the moon, you know? Um, and, and I said, no, I, I, I really wanna do news now. And he got up from his desk after about an hour and, uh, of, uh, of the uh, interview and he came around 
to me and he put his arms around me and he said, Kelly, you are either the bravest person I've ever met or the stupidest. He said, <laughs> I wish you luck. And so I went back to LA and I was taking, packing up my office because we were fit. It was the last, last of my day. So on the air and um, John Severino, remember John? Yes, I do. A very good friend of mine. He was head of uh, ABC News. All right. And um, Channel 7. Yeah. He offered a job uh, anchoring the news uh, on, on one of the newscasts and doing the morning show and this and that. And then NBC had in the contract, do you remember the meet and match? They had, they had uh, seven days, calendar days, to meet and match the conditions of the offer you got. And if they can do as good or better, if they can match it or, or do better, then you have to stay at Channel 4. I didn't right. even, I wasn't even aware of that in my contract, but there it was, because who yeah. reads those things, you know? But, um, and they did match it. And uh, that's how I became an anchor. Now, interestingly enough, it was not easy. The first couple of years, nobody wanted me as an anchor, not Brokaw, uh, not Snyder, not even Jess Marlowe. Um, mm -hmm. No, because it was a man's uh, enclave. It wasn't for women. And, no. um, and they, they, they really made it hard for me. But I worked my tail off and, um, and the, finally won some respect, you know? And I won the only, uh, the only time they gave uh, a local uh, um, Emmy for, for um, anchors. They only did it one year. And I didn't, I went, I was brand new as an anchor and I wore my, you know, black tie outfit and looked good, but it was Brokaw and, um, oh gosh, who are the rest of them in the, in the uh, I can't even remember, but all of the anchors from all over the LA area. And I won, I couldn't believe it. I, I think, I think Lynn and I were there that night because we went with Tom and Marianne Snyder Okay. And we, were in tux we were in tuxedos and, oh, yeah. and, and, and there yeah. you were, you were the winner. I know. And I had no idea. I had no, I mean, I still don't know why, uh, you know, but, but I did become respected as an anchor and did it for many, many years. You know, what impressed me about you and talking to you, it's even more, more um, fortified. You, you advanced yourself each step of the way. And I get the idea that you pretty much did it on your own, didn't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, Ross, you and I worked at the station long enough to see people brought in, good-looking, graduated from Harvard, had an uncle who was a senator, got the job, they were introduced to everybody. They didn't do the work. And really, to do the work, you've got to learn. It's different everywhere, and everything that you do is different. You have to learn each time how to... So I did, but they didn't. A lot of them didn't. They were in and out. There was one called Star Jones. Remember her? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they brought her in and she was a lawyer. And But she lasted a couple of months. You know, I mean, you got to do it. You got to do the work. Uh, People think, you know, that we go in there and we just are handed some copy and we read it. Not that way. I have, I wrote every word I ever said. It was written. We had writers. I, I did too. I did too. Oh. And I couldn't, I never used a teleprompter, Kelly, because I was nearsighted. I couldn't read it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and then when you wrote it, when you tweaked it, first of all, they become very familiar with it. And then it's, it's written in your style. So it's a lot easier for you. So you're actually talking it. You're not just reading it. And so a lot of people, my daughter wanted to be, uh, a reporter, and I told her those things. I said, you know, don't just cover the stories they, she worked out of um, Oxnard, yeah. and she worked for CNN. Don't just go where they send you. Uh, effort some stories on your own. Say, look, here's something that I really would love to cover, and I taught her how to do it, and she did it too. You know, it's work. W-O-R-K, it's a four-letter word, but it'll get you what you want. Yeah, well, for, for instance, how did you get on What's my line? Oh, um, well, I somebody at the, at the radio station where I was working, or, oh, I know, wait, wait, oh, no, I, I remember now. It, there was a, a write-up of me doing as the first woman helicopter, you know, reporter in mm -hmm. um, TV Guide. 
And it turns out that that's how they chose people, you know, the, the, the producers at What's My Line were looking at everything to bring people. And it was also in Time Magazine and they found me. Mm -hmm. They found me and called the station and that's how that got set up. All right. So quite a few years later, Oh yeah. <laughs> TV Guide reported that the first Los Angeles newscaster to be paid $1 million a year was not oh. Jerry Dunphy, not Tom Brokaw, not Tom Snyder, but Kelly Lang. And if that's true, how'd that make you feel? Pretty good. <laughs> My agent, uh, I got calls from a lot of agents. You should have an agent. I said, I have enough jobs. I don't want an agent. We're going to get you better jobs, they said. So they <laughs> got me a guy called um, Michael. Oh, Michael, what's his name? The big one. The, the, Ed Hookstratton? No, not Ed. Michael Ovitz. Mike Ovitz. Right, okay. Yeah. And he was doing my money from that time on. And um, yeah, I got a big, big raise. It was a big deal. Yeah. Mm. It's all gone. Know. Uh, Ross, I gotta tell you, I'm now broke. <laughs> <laughs> no. I spent it all. Yeah. I, I left Channel 4 in December of 1976 Ooh. to join the Dodgers. Yes, you announcing did. team. And you oh. hosted a farewell party for me in your home, Ooh. which was so kind of you to do. And I never forgot that, and Lynn yeah, didn't either. That. Yeah, didn't we have a cake that was made of like a baseball? I probably so. Yeah. And <laughs> you had you had all of our friends from the news business, and the big surprise was when Ed McMahon walked in the door. Oh yeah, mm, yeah. I'd met him one time, I think, <laughs> yeah, but he well, came. Yeah, but he that, that same month, Kelly became a television news anchor. Was the same month I left Channel Four, and you were a news anchor for 22 years yeah. december of 1976 to december of 1988 that that was that was unbelievable 98 yeah 98 and uh i will also work in since i'm talking a little bit about the dodgers your lovely daughter kelly worked at dodger stadium didn't she oh my goodness you know she came home from school one night and she said her best friend mandy morheim lived across the street was was getting a job in a stationery store in beverly hills after school and they said they could use another young gal and can i take the job and i said well you know sit down honey let's talk about it i said do you have a passion for stationery and she looked at me she said what and I said, you know, do you love the colors and the texture and the parchment and the print and stationery? Does it turn you on, you know? And she looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, look, when you think about taking a job, committing to a job, it's very important that you commit to something you really love. Now, do you tell me, what do you have a passion for? Well, I knew she was a giant Dodger fan, you know? And um, so we talked about that. And I said, well, if you want to get a job after school, why don't you find out if you can get a job at Dodger Stadium? And she said, could I do that? I said, I don't know. I don't know. Go find out. She was just, she, I had bought her a new car. She was 16 and she had her license. And I said, get in your car and go to Dodger Stadium and find out. She said, well, what do I do there? I said, I don't know. I have no idea, honey. Go and talk to somebody. Where do I go to apply for a job? Blah, blah, blah. So she did. She did. And that night she came home. Um, after hours at Dodger Stadium talking to everybody and she was de in dejected. She said, they don't hire anybody under 18. That's when I called Tommy Lasorda, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> I called Tommy and I said, look, my daughter, I knew him pretty well, we all did. He, he was LA, right? Yeah. And I said, she's 16 going on 35. She's really smart and she just is, she has Dodger blue blood in her veins you know so that's how she got the job there huh. and her first her first uh job they put her in what they called the dungeon that's uh, right down below yeah, down, down below, below where she wasn't selling t-shirts she was piling up t-shirts and souvenirs and stuff um on carts for people to sell upstairs she never saw the light of day right um she loved it Are you kidding she was touching dodger stuff you know right and then, um 
And then there's a guy, I don't know if you remember, Danny Goodman. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Danny. The marvelous, the marvelous marketing director. Yeah. And, and oh, he, he was so good. And he loved her, you know. I mean, he, she, she was a hard worker like we are. And he so he brought her up into the gift shop. And that's where your wife and you saw her, you know, working yeah. in the gift shop. And then um, somebody else. I, I Don so, Sutton helped her, didn't he? Well, Don loved her. This was, he, we all loved Don. Was yeah. he a great guy? But um, he, then she got the job. They recruited her and put her on as a program seller, yeah. where you sell programs yeah. for what an hour or two before the game and about two or three innings, and then you get to knock it off and go up and watch the game. Yeah. This is where she got to know all of them. She loved Don especially, and he gave her his jacket from that he wore at in a playoff game and oh. it still had dodger mud all over it and she <laughs> still has it and she never washed it she wouldn't of course and yeah. she went to um a, a playoff game you know the last time they had the playoffs in la she went and she wore don's um jack shirt oh. with his number and his name and um and she stood in, in front of don's picture that's up at Dodger Stadium, you know, all the, yeah, the big area. Yeah. So yeah. she's still a big Dodger fan. And she worked there all during high school. I mean, no, the last three years of high school and four years of college. That was her weekend. Wow. And yeah. Yeah. You um, you got some glamorous NBC network assignments, regular mm -hmm. guest host of the Today and the Tomorrow shows. Yes. Co-host of the Tournament of Roses Parade for 10 years. Um, you also co-hosted a program one time with uh, Willard Scott, who was the weatherman for the Today Show. Oh, well, I know I knew him from doing the Today Show so many times. First time I met Willard, they pick you up at four in the morning in New York at your hotel to make sure you get there. They said, and I got in the car and next to me is sitting Willard Scott. I never met him. And he said, hello. He said, hold this. And he had a box in his hand. He, he put the, he gave me the box. And so I had, he said, while he reached into his pockets to get something else, 4 a.m. I got his box and there was a jolt in the car and the box flew off my lap. And he said, he said, be careful with that. That's my hair. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to know, I got to know um, Willard. And of course, everybody I worked with Tom Brokaw there. Yep. And, um, and yeah, then I was invited because I did the Rose Parade here in Pasadena for 10 years with Michael Landon. Um, and I got called to do Rose Parades in other places, in yeah. Arizona, in um, uh, Portland, Oregon, the Portland Rose Parade. Right. And that's the one I did with Willard. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sitting in my office now and uh, you can't see it, but that's the only picture I have on my office of the team. It's Willard and me. He was a dog. Oh. He was a sweetheart. Yeah. Well, after winning many local Emmys in 28 years on KNBC, you left the station. Why? Well, I had started writing novels, and one of my best friends was Sue Grafton. She wrote mysteries. Yes. All of it mysteries. And Mary Higgins Clark was a friend of mine because I was in New York a lot, and I knew her. Um, and I was writing novels, and I was going out on the book uh, cycle and uh, you know the uh, signing books in bookstores and doing um special round table luncheons with and and i thought i could make a good living writing books um i made i did okay i did fine i sold a lot of books it was never going to be like television money but you know i i had done it long enough had you written oh, trophy wife at that time yes yeah and by the way um, a mutual friend of yours and mine, I met on the book tour, and that is Rayford Johnson. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Oh, my God. And I know that you're still working to get him the Medal of Freedom, right? That is correct. Rayford and I became very close friends. He lived very near my house up in right. the valley. That's and right. what an angel. I mean, his story, living in a boxcar when, you know, his parents were um, right. sharecroppers and... and uh, I, I, how's that going, by the way? Well, we're on, and Tom Brokaw's uh, working with me on that. Oh, we, thank God. I found out that there has never been a posthumous oh. winner of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And Tom, who has that 
Metal himself. Yes, he does. I remember. Said, you know, and, and he agreed with me when I said, if there's anybody who deserves this medal, it's Rafer Johnson for what he did. And there must have been, Kelly, 200 or 300 different winners over the years. And he has always been bypassed. But we're making some inroads on it. And hopefully, in a few months, we'll get the good news that he made it. But uh, you're absolutely right. One of the one of the finest human beings. Yes, we both, we both ever do. Rafer Johnson, and also a great athlete who overcame injuries that several injuries, and, and just never gave up on what he did. And and we talked to him a lot over the years. And Lynn one day said to him, Rafer. You could have done anything you wanted to do. You could have been a movie star. You could have done a lot of things. Oh, yeah. You chose though to go another route. Why? And he said, because of the people who helped me when I was a youngster growing up in Kingsburg, California, would take me to track meets. All of them were white fathers. And I said to myself at that time, I want everybody to be the best they can be. Yes. And, and that's what that was his motto. Oh yeah, and you know, if they've never done it posthumously, as you know, and I know, there is always a first time, you know, and there will be, there will be, just believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in 1999, you were given the coveted Governor's Award by the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Oh yeah. In 2010, <laughs> you were presented with the Golden Mike's Lifetime Achievement Award by the Radio and Television News Association of Southern California. And you were really into the, the, the book writing at that time. Uh, you told me, I think one time that you started writing while you were still a news anchor, uh, partially to relieve insomnia, working oh, yeah. on the 11 o'clock news at night. Yeah, I don't know if you had that, but a lot of newsies that I know never got off that clock, which we worked the four, the six and the 11, and then after the 11 o'clock news, we never went home. Um, you, I, I don't know if you knew Wendy Harris, who was the producer no, then. No, I did not, no. Well, we would um, we would sit and we'd archive the show while she did that and talk about assignments for the next day and then break out the wine and have a lot of laughs. And we had a, the meeting about what went wrong with the show, which the meeting was always longer than the show. Anyway, I never got out of there till like, two in the morning, you know, and, but it was fun. It was part of what we did and it was, it was good. And it was, it was informative. But by the time I drove home with my dog, I always brought my dog to work. Um, I couldn't sleep because you're still wired. You know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I had the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, because, so much because both, both of us kind of had the same career pattern. I did late night news with you and the others. Yes. I went to the Dodgers for 28 years and they were all night games and you couldn't just come down off the hill at midnight. So I went through the same thing you did. Oh yeah. So that's why. And so I, when I got, when I get home, everybody was asleep. There was nobody to talk to and nobody to play with. And um, so, and I read novels. I love novels. I love mysteries. And I, one day I just said, you know, I could write one of these. So I started instead of reading at night till uh, the light came in the windows and the book fell off the bed onto the floor, I started writing one. And I, I just figured out how to do it. I never had any lessons or anything. And um, the first one was a big, big seller, you know? And then I, that's how I started writing. Yes, I would write in the middle of the night when nobody would call me, nobody would bother me. And it was fun. Well, yeah, you, 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 you created a main character that you named Maxie Poole, yeah. who's really the heroine in all six of your books. Tell everybody who Maxie is. Is she another Kelly Lang? Well, yeah, she's me. Uh, she's named after my sister, by the way. Huh. But, uh, just for fun, because I didn't know anything was going to go anywhere. And um, yeah, she's, she's exactly me, except she's taller, thinner, younger, uh, better looking, and uh, sexier, you know, than me. But yeah, and she's a reporter, anchor, um, talk show host, all the stuff I was, except she's not a novelist. She's a she's me in the newsroom. And um, I learned so much writing books. You know, it was published by Simon and Schuster and Warner Books. And I would write something crazy that happened 
and I would write, my character would go through this and um, uh, the editor would say, that's not credible, take that out. And I would tell her, well, it happened to me in the newsroom. And she'd say, that doesn't matter. It's not credible to your readers. Mm. So I learned that. Like I just saw a movie called Licorice Pizza. None of it made any sense to me. It's a big hot movie right now. And uh, somebody sent me a thing saying that the guy who wrote it, he went through all that stuff. Yeah. And that's what I learned. If it's not credible to your viewer or your reader, it doesn't work. It doesn't fly as a good story. That's my opinion anyway. Yeah. But it was, it's a lot of fun. And I found myself thinking all day long about, you know, getting a, an idea for a character to do or uh, anybody can do it, you know, I think. Well, another thing about your books, uh, you're socially conscious uh, in your books. I, and a, a good example was the one where Maxie cannot drink wine before she drives her car. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, Ross, you know more about me than I do. It's amazing all the stuff that you came up with. Um, yeah. Uh, and when I was working uh, at, at KNBC, you know, we got bags of mail every day, right? And I hired, do you remember Sally Lynch? She was- yes, I do very well. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. our newsroom wonderful mother. Lady. Wonderful yeah. newsroom mother. I yeah. hired her to answer with me every bit of mail, every piece of mail, except the ones that were so crazy and written in the margin on in crayon or threatening or something. Yeah. But, um, I answered every piece of mail Yeah. Uh, because it was important to me to do that because I realized, my God, I'm touching people. Yeah. They, would oh, yeah. Write me, yeah. they would write me about their lives. And one time I was making a speech. Um, it was a book signing speech in uh, Torrance, California. And I went there and I was uh, introduced by the mayor of Torrance. And she had a piece of paper in her hand. And she said, I want to introduce Kelly Lang. You all know her on television. But seven years ago, she wrote me a letter and she had it in her hand. Wow. And she had written to me, I forgot, of course, because I don't, you don't remember. And um, she had written to me that she had been, she got a divorce, her husband divorced her, she was very sick, she wanted to kill her, so all this stuff. Yeah. And I wrote her a letter as giving her some advice oh. and telling her, you know, get over it, open your eyes, pull yourself up and get out there and live your life that God gave you and blah, yeah. blah. She yeah. read the letter, I couldn't even remember it. I know. But she said, this changed my life. Yeah. So it was very important to me to answer people who had problems or who wanted to just talk or, who, you know. Who, well, I didn't have to answer as many letters as you did. About sports? But Are you kidding? Not as much. Although I did get a letter one time and the envelope said, Mr. Raw, R-A-W, <laughs> Porter, S-P-O-R-T-E-R. <laughs> I want to tell you about the people who've had some trouble with uh, uh, internal Sporter. organs. Yeah. So Ross Sporter uh, yeah. tried to answer him, but that, that, that was the only one. Yeah. I, gotta I gotta tell a personal story. Yeah. One night you were having a book signing, I think in Encino. And that night, Lynn and some of her friends were gonna go to the Hollywood Bowl for a performance. And they got in the car and Lynn said, wait a minute, Kelly's having her book signing tonight. Let's drop by there on the way. They said, all right. They came to your book signing and you were so interesting that they never got to the Hollywood Bowl. They stayed oh, with you. <laughs> wow. And that's an expensive ticket, too. Oh, wow. But, you know, about the raw sporter, we had a woman and you probably don't. She wasn't doing this when you were there, but her name was Karna Small, K-A-R-N-A -A, Small. And she was she worked in San Francisco and she did teases into our news all day long and we did teases into their news. That was a deal we had. Yeah, and she sure. would end her piece every day saying, um, I'm Karna Small for Channel 4 News. And I got a letter one time and it was from a woman. And she said, why does that woman keep telling us she's kind of small? We don't care. We don't care <laughs> how big she is. You know, oh. why does she keep saying that? I put it on the bulletin board because it was so funny, Karna Small. I'd never met her even. Mm. But yeah. They were, were you allowed? to give the titles to your books? Or were the publishers the one who did that? Um, no, I did, I did, yeah. You, you, 
You know, I found out that in publishing, Ross, and by the way, isn't it about time you wrote a book? You've got such a life. Oh my, you're having such a life. But, um, you know, when you're in news, the editors, oh, we have to cut this piece down from a minute 45 to uh, 40 minute, 40 seconds. And they just chop off the middle, something in the middle. But in publishing, you're the final arbiter. You get to decide. They tell you, they say, you know, they give you notes and they say, this is not good. Can we change it to this? I usually took about 85% of all of their notes because they knew better than I did about what sells a book. But um, but I I got I got to write my own uh, blurbs on the side of the book. Usually it was their company that did it. And after a couple, two, three books, they let me do it. And they let me uh, choose the title, yeah. Kelly, do you have movie rights to all your books? Is that one of your dreams? No, I haven't thought about it, but that would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, maybe I should think about that <laughs> because there hasn't been um, a character since Murphy Brown, who yeah. was a news person, you know, and maybe maybe Maxie, maybe my Maxie should uh, make an appearance, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> okay. um, Kelly, tell us what your philosophy in life is. Interesting question, mm, Ross. Um, well, um, I am a science of mind, and that is not a religion, it's a teaching. And I go to church every Sunday, and I believe it. And science of mind, the main tenet is your mind creates your experience. So believe it, you will see it. If you're going in for a job interview and you say, oh gosh, I'm too old, I'm too fat, nobody, I, I don't know enough, you won't get it because you, you, you know, put forth that kind of vibe and people get it. We read each other all the time. You read, we read people's faces. And um, so I, I always expect the best. And as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. Yeah. And that works for me. Mm. And I've been so lucky, you know, I mean, my goodness, I've been so lucky. And I'm very thankful. I'm very, very grateful for everything that I have, everything I am, everything I was, everything I've done. I'm grateful. I mean, grateful that we were born in this country, this freedom we have. Yeah. And be careful of our democracy right now. It's fragile. You know, I'm still a news junkie, Ross. Yeah. First thing in the morning, the TV goes on and it's on all day. Um, all right. But yeah. I'm grateful. I, I, I was, I, I've been so grateful. You too. Yes, I do. Yeah, we do. I know, I know. Yeah. Kelly, so. this has been a genuine pleasure to talk with you. Stay in good health. Continue to, to live that productive life that, that you are living. And uh, blessings to you, my dear. Thank you so much. I adore you. And uh, keep on keeping on, Ross. We love you. Mwah. And hide a Great. Kelly Lang. Thank you.